Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be up here uh, uh, on behalf of Bain as the sponsor for the event this morning. I've been coming to these for years, and I always learn something. There's always great speakers here, and uh, it's a great, uh, great event. So uh, very happy to be here. Um, uh, how many of you are uh, Star Wars fans? Okay, good. So then you'll remember um, Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo gets frozen in the block of carbonite, right? At the end of that, and then, and then uh, they, they eventually thaw him out and everything. So when, when Kathy and Josh suggested that, um, you know, that, that it would be carbonite this morning, I, I sort of momentarily, um, I guess you could say, tried to say froze in terror at the concept that I might have to introduce Darth Vader or something like that. But no, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that it's not Darth. I have the pleasure of introducing Norman Guadagno this morning. Uh, Norman is the chief evangelist and senior vice president of marketing at Carbonite. And before joining Carbonite, uh, Norman was uh, SVP of marketing strategy at Wirestone, uh, working with clients like uh, Microsoft, Boeing, and Nike. And uh, before that, uh, he'd also been at Microsoft and Oracle, as well as uh, some other leading agencies as well. So uh, Norman uh, began as a user interaction uh, specialist and interest in that field, and has a master's in psychology from Rice uh, and a, uh, his BA from, uh, in psychology from the University of Rochester. So um, please help me in welcoming Norman Guadagno to the stage. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for those warm introductions. It's hard to sort of top those as we go through here. Uh, I have very few slides, uh, which I'm going to click through. I have a clicker up here. I'm also very old-fashioned in that I have uh, cards here that I sort of outline what I'm going to talk about uh, as we go through here today. So you'll indulge me as I use my note cards, because I had so much I wanted to cover. I wanted to make sure that I got it all out uh, on the table. So I'm going to uh, actually talk about three different things this morning and uh, try to get it all into the amount of time that we have and leave plenty of time for questions and answers. But the three things I'm going to talk about, uh, as Kathy said, were we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, transformation that we've gone through at Carbonite. I'll tell you a little bit about Carbonite in a moment. I'm going to talk about this notion of uh, security and privacy and why you should be very, very afraid and all the things that go along with that. Uh, and then I want to try to bring it together with some of the lessons that perhaps uh, we've learned over the past few years. Uh, Kathy asked everyone to raise their hand if you've been uh, a victim of a cyber attack or something similar. If you didn't raise your hand, it's just because you don't know honestly. So uh, trust me, we all have been. We just may not know it yet. And you'll see that as we, uh, as we go through this talk. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Carbonite. Uh, who here has heard of Carbonite? Awesome. We're doing our job well at, at marketing. We are uh, fairly well known here in the Boston area. Carbonite is a public company. We are about a uh, thousand people, or we were before last week when we announced another acquisition, and we have uh, been in business for about a dozen years. The company was founded to solve a simple problem. One of the uh, founders, you know, his daughter, had a, uh, had a mishap with a laptop, lost a school paper, uh, and he, being a brilliant person, decided there had to be a better way to deal with that and invented, in fact, one of the first cloud services. So we've been in the cloud for a long time. And we started as a backup company for consumers. You've probably long ago heard our radio ads or saw our uh, ads online as we built a consumer business helping people back up their laptops, back when everyone had laptops all the time and even before everyone had a mobile phone. Over time, that has continued to morph and change. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how we went from a company founded on selling direct to consumers to the company we are today, where we are primarily a business provider. Most of our revenue comes from business, but we still have some consumer customers. And we've continued to grow fairly aggressively over the past few years. So the sort of first section that I'm going to talk about is this sort of B2C to B2B. And 
I'll start out by really sort of emphasizing why we did it, because we often get asked, like, well, why did you do that? Well, the simple answer is the consumer backup market was declining. Right? So there's sort of no other answer other than it was declining. There's a lot of reasons, the cloud, mobile devices. You can think of all the different reasons why. But the consumer market was declining. And as a result, the company decided to make a shift to the business market. It had been developing some business solutions and started to make that shift quite a number of years ago. I've been at the company for three years now. I had worked with them for almost uh, two years before that uh, as they were my client when I was on the agency side. That's how I ended up in this role. So for those of you who've been on both sides, you know that's the easiest way to move from one to the other is move to your client or move to your agency. And it happens all the time. So that, in fact, is what I did here. But I actually joined the company because I was really intrigued by the challenge and the challenge of taking a business that was growing that brought in a new CEO who was building a new executive team and taking something that was a well-established consumer brand and figuring out how to make it a business brand. And that's really hard. And the first point of this is how many of you work in B2C here? A few people have about B2B folks, or generically all of the above, right? And it turns out that all of the above is actually a lot of businesses. When we began the process of moving from B to C to B2B, internally it was a very much a, well, yeah, we just sort of advertise to these other folks over here instead of these folks up here, and we have a product for them, so of course they're going to buy it. Not quite exactly how it works. First of all, the company had spent a, nearly a decade and probably a hundred million plus dollars building a consumer brand. Endless direct marketing, TV ads, radio sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you asked anybody what Carbonite was, if they had an answer, like, oh, that's that backup stuff that my grandmother uses. And it was very much a deeply, deeply seated belief, not only in the market we were leaving, and this was one of the first big lessons, but in the market we were trying to enter into. So when we went to partners in the channel or we went to businesses, we had to get over this massive wall of, oh, yeah, you're a consumer solution. And doing that is really hard. <laughs> it takes an amazing amount of diligent effort. It also takes a lot of internal work because inside the company, most of us here are marketing or advertising or related people. Companies also have engineering people and salespeople, all who do amazing jobs, most of whom often believe that, oh, well, we're a business company now. We have a solution, so everyone will just believe us when we tell them. Go out, marketers, and tell people that we have the solution for them, and they'll believe you. Because engineers, for better or worse, tend to be a little bit more uh, black and white sometimes than marketers. So we would say, of course, we're going to go out and spend a lot of money and tell people that we're a business provider, at which they summarily laughed at us. Ha, ha, ha. No, you're a consumer company, because you've been telling me for a decade. Well, yeah, but we have this great product now. Yeah, but everyone is your consumer. So we went through this process of having to figure out how to get the market to really understand that we were something different. And being patient was one of the key components of being successful because you can't do it overnight. We not only had to start to build that engine, but we also had to figure out how to slowly remove ourselves from the consumer advertising that we had been doing and slowly change the messages and not give up the revenue. So when I say we're a B to B company, I, I just ignore the hundred million-ish dollars of consumer revenue that we might have because that's over there. We don't talk about that anymore. That's mostly renewal business. We're a SaaS business. So we don't talk a lot about that, but it's still there and it's still part of the brand. And finding the balance of shifting dollars away from that to the B2B space and creating a message that resonates with our business buyers has taken a long time. We began a process 
almost three years ago, we started to invest slowly. We started to change all the language of everything we did. One of the first big ep efforts we made was start to remove references and pictures and things that felt consumery and substitute it in business, even as we still were targeting a very broad audience. So we had to begin to introduce a new language of what we were talking about. We also had to rebuild excuse me, how people think about how people buy. Because as a consumer business, we were primarily transactional, click and buy. As a B2B business, we have a funnel and we have stages and it takes a while to get those deals from inception to close. Companies have an inherent DNA of this is the way we operate. And so everything can operate that way. So as we moved away from the traditional B2C transactional and basically spend money on advertising, get return on ad spend metrics, to longer life cycles, different way of measuring everything, the company itself sort of didn't quite know how to digest that. It's like, yeah, but you're spending a bunch of money over here. What's the return on ad spend? What's the ROI? And it's like, no, you can't measure it that way. It's like, oh, OK, but can you do it that way? And like, no, you can't do it that way. You have to start to rethink that. So when we began this process, we did not have any notion whatsoever internally of a pipeline or a funnel. So we had to build from the ground up. We're going to now get leads. Not customers who click and buy, but leads. And we're going to take those leads through a sequence during their buying journey. And then, after we spend a year, year and a half teaching everyone inside the company, here's what leads are, and here's how you get from MQL to MAL to MQL down to ultimately somebody buying. Then we started to teach the company about pipeline. What is it? Leads turn into pipeline. Dollars predict the future. And, and it seems like that's a bunch of procedural stuff. But any business that's going through the transformation of one business model to another business model, you can't just simply say, OK, we're doing this thing over here. Well, sometimes you can. But for the most part, what you have to do is you have to rebuild and re-educate not just your market, but also your internal constituencies, your sales and marketing and engineering and finance, all of whom have to embrace what it means to be something different. And that is a process we're still doing. We're not 100% there. We have measure our own brand and uh, the perception of our brand. And over time, it has shifted so people see us now as a business brand. Unless you're one of our consumer customers, then you still see us as a consumer brand. But most folks now have begun to see us as a business brand. And we've done that through a, a significant amount of advertising, shifting of dollars, moving more emphasis to the channel, creating content, creating new products. We've also done it through M&A work. So if you're not familiar with how Carbonite's grown over the past few years, we have grown both organically and through M&A. And I have a, a long list that I always try to remember of all the M&A work we've done over time, which is this little list here. Uh, in the time I've been there, we've made five acquisitions, one, two, three, four, five, uh, plus a customer acquisition, including an acquisition that we announced last week, which was the largest acquisition we've made to date. We bought a company called Webroot. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the security space uh, in a moment. But that acquisition, which uh, was a $615 million acquisition, $618 million acquisition, significantly increases the size of the business adds a, an adjacency to what we've been doing. And oh, by the way, and I can't talk a lot about the acquisition because we're in this period between sign and close, but nonetheless, guess what they have? A really big consumer business. <laughs> and they have a business business, but they have a business, they have a big consumer business. That is an, a new challenge that we're going to have to face in the years ahead as we find a way to continue to weave this path through growing the business and trying to position the company overall as satisfying the needs of businesses, satisfying the needs of our channel partners, but not let go of the reality of the revenue and the base that we have in the consumer side. And and you'd think this would be easy. Well, actually, it, you wouldn't think it would be easy. It's not easy. But what it is, is it's, it's about 
finding the way to rethink the problem. And, and this has been one of the things that I've spent a lot of time with my team and others on. We have tried to rethink the problem so that we stop actually differentiating between consumers and businesses. And, and for some of you in your businesses, you may have already discovered this or figured out this reality. What, what we've spent a lot of time in is stop talking about the consumer versus the business buyer and start talking about the channels to market, the ways in which we sell, and the fact that the individual, any one of you who buys our product to protect your laptop, is essentially doing the exact same thing as the business that buys that product to protect all the laptops and servers in the business, and as the enterprise that's buying it for everybody. So if you start to think of it on a long and new continuum, you reframe the problem away from consumer versus business, and you frame the problem individual to groups, then it becomes something where you can start to refocus the brand efforts around how are you achieving the right thing for this larger group versus we just sell to consumers, we just sell to business. You change the mechanics underneath, but you also change the, the, the message and the framing. And being able to frame a problem appropriately is critical as well. One of the things we found endlessly as we've gone through iteration after iteration of going to market is making sure we're understanding which problem we're actually trying to solve and how can we frame it appropriately to our best advantage. And that leads to the sort of second part of this discussion, which is this sort of notion of fear and privacy. <sighs> so we established earlier on you've all been hacked. You just don't necessarily know it. It's, it's an interesting problem. I travel a bunch. And when I travel, uh, I, have a, I spend a lot of time on airplanes. And I make note on every airplane trip of how many people I see with a laptop open so I can read over their shoulder their highly confidential information, taking that said open laptop, putting it down on their seat, still active, open, and logged in, and going to the restroom so I could take their laptop and either put something on it with a quick USB stick or physically take it, read all their stuff, and hand it back. I have not been on a plane trip in the past three years that that has not occurred. And when you think about that, that is one of the scariest possible things that could go on. How many of you have done it? Admit it. <laughs> How many of you have a privacy screen on your laptop or phone? And don't work for Carbonite, one of our agencies. <laughs> Today's world is a world where information is power. Right? It's trite to say that. And so I've been trying to find a different way to say it. And, and I think about it through this lens lately. Think about this as privacy is the new customer experience. Think about the notion of privacy and your right to privacy as a fundamental right, which I believe is actually true. And you are in the process right now of allowing your information and your privacy to be siphoned off in all sorts of different places. We at Carbonite have been evolving towards a model of how can we protect you by protecting your data, whether you be a business or you be an individual, it doesn't really matter. We are under assault from forces both malicious, malicious hackers, nation states, others, forces arbitrary hurricanes, floods, all sorts of things. Forces like machines that break, mistakes that people make. Every one of those things is threatening your data. And I guarantee you there is no one in this room who could get by without their data for very long. How many of you have one device with you right now? How many of you have two devices with you right now? How many of you have three devices with you right now? <laughs> How many has four? Does anyone have more than four devices with them right now? 
All of those devices contain a bunch of different data. If you're a perfect citizen, you have it all backed up, and it all lives in the cloud, and it's all secure, and you have rotating multiple passwords for every single account. I don't think any of us are perfect citizens. How many of you could tell me how many cloud services you log into, both physically, manually, and automatically each day? Anybody? I, I actually don't know the answer. The answer for any new person is dozens. How many of you can tell me all the data that it lives in all of those cloud services that you log into every single day and could get access to it? Or who owns it? Or who's using it? And if you want any more proof of the malicious intent of data, wherever it may be, you just read the headlines in the story that's playing out with Jeff Bezos and his, uh, his being attacked, essentially. How did someone get those messages and pictures? Maybe someday we'll find out. But it gets to the very nature of privacy as a right. Privacy is a new experience. We at Carbonite, that's our business. So we've done that through data protection, backup and restore. We're now, with the acquisition of WebRoot, extending that to the ability to protect the perimeter against malicious attacks. But the more important point from my perspective is, what's the role of marketing in addressing these issues of privacy and data and attacks and all of the other elements? Because unfortunately, and, and this may be true for some of you, unfortunately, in many instances, marketing is on the tail end of the equation. How many of you have worked for a company that has suffered some sort of hack or breach? A few people here. Right? How many of you were marketers that were actively involved in the process when that occurred and then informing and communicating after it occurred? More often than not, marketing is brought in at the tail end of the process to explain away what went on. And you want to know something? That is just dead wrong. Marketing should be at the front of the process, helping businesses explain to their customers why privacy is important, why the data is secure, why the company is acting in a transparent and hopefully legal and ethical fashion. But it's not usually the case for many different reasons. Many businesses operate in a lot of different fashions, but all businesses today hold data. Your data, my data, everyone else's data. And all businesses today, in fact, have a, an obligation to protect that data. They have an obligation to inform their customers and partners when something happens to that data or even before what is going on in terms of protecting that data. Most businesses fail to do that. And if they do it, for better or worse, they leave the communication aspect to privacy or security or legal and bring in marketing on the tail end. And as a marketer, and really in marketing what we do is communications ultimately, regardless of all the fun we have with data and analytics and everything else, ultimately it's about communication. And, and I want to make a plea to marketers and to other businesses to say that if marketing is not involved in communicating what a business is, how it deals with data, how it protects your privacy, how it manages dealing with an attack if there's an attack or a breach and everything that comes after, then the business is going to end up suffering. Our job is to understand how to communicate that. That forces it, if you're a marketer in any company, whether you're in a CPG or tech or biotech or finance or healthcare, if you do not understand all the fundamentals of data privacy, attacks, cyber attacks, how to manage communication around that, what it means to have a breach, then you need to go get educated right away because the job's going to fall on all of us to make sure we're communicating. Because you want to know something? This is the headline for the rest of our lives. You cannot get away from this headline. 
this headline is going to come back again and again and again. And I think marketers can take ownership of helping businesses be better at communicating. We're in the business of protecting that data. We try to do it really well. We, we have a bunch of clear guidelines around it. If you're going to lose your data, we have backup protection. With the web root acquisition, we'll have the ability to be able to protect the perimeter. That's our business. So of course, I think about this stuff all the time. But, but I want it to be a plea to marketers in every sector to start thinking about the fact that you can't go in and say, hey, we're super data centric and we do all sorts of data analytics. These are what telling me about all the fun data analytics that you know, they do and other companies do, right? And then not take responsibility for actually knowing how to talk about and protect privacy and information and think about the problem. You can't use the data if you can't think about the larger problem that you can confront. And that, that's tricky because Sometimes we just don't want to do that. We want to be able to focus on other things. So we've had this issue at Carbonite for a long time of how do we get people, our customers, aware of the problem, right? And when I first got to Carbonite, we did a lot of consumer ads, and those ads were all about a uh, laptop has coffee spill on it. If I ever see another laptop and coffee cup picture again, I'll die. But you have a lot of those. Or you have, you know, someone steals it, or you have it fall. And then we sort of moved away from a lot of the fear, because frankly, that was marketing driven by fear. Uh, and we tried to find a different way to address the problem. And for the first couple of years, we were handed a gift. Thank you, malicious hackers everywhere. We were handed the gift of ransomware. Everybody know what ransomware is? If you don't, simple. You get a nice email that says, hey, I'm going to hold your machine hostage unless you pay me. And sorry it's too late because I've already encrypted all your files. Tough luck. Send Bitcoin here. We were fortunate that, in some ways, ransomware hit a peak a couple of years ago, although it still continues to grow and morph. And we were in a position to leverage that in the market. And we were, in fact, one of the first vendors in our space to aggressively go into market and say, ransomware is a scary thing. We, have, we had an ad we ran that had a guy in a ski mask. And it was scary and threatening and was the best performing ad we ever had. And the reason was that it, became, it made it real for our customers. How do you make this fear real? Because it's easy for us to not pay attention to fear. And we have tried again and again and again to find new ways to make the fear of what could happen real so people take action, but to not make it so threatening that it turns people off. Because you want to know something? I don't actually like doing marketing where it's all about scaring the pants off of people. I don't think generating so much fear is actually a good thing. Get your adrenaline going. and sort of have everyone being not feeling great about it. I prefer to try to find other ways to tell the story. We did that really well with ransomware. We continue to evolve that story. But everything we do, even for our biggest customers, comes down to a simple human fear. What if something goes wrong? And I, typically in a big business, an IT person or a similar job or a, a business owner in a small business, what am I going to do? And addressing that core fear it has been part of this journey as we've gone from B to C to B to B. And as we've really tried to shape the message that we bring to market, it's about finding ways to endlessly address that core fear and then elevate out of it the solution that we're going to bring. So I'm going to show one quick advertisement here just to sort of give you a sense. This is something we produced late last year, and it gives you a sense for what, we, uh, what we're doing. So I'll let the commercial roll. Dave, the servers are down, all the systems, everything stopped. 
everything. Come on, buddy. Everything's up and running. Yeah, Sarah's back online. Yes, the girl actually did play the cello. She's a very precocious young actress. Uh, I, I show the ad for a number of different reasons. One, uh, I just happen to love it. Uh, two, uh, props to my team and to our, our agency for the creation of it. It's, it's really solid way to tell the story. But, but more importantly, it's part of us continuing this evolution of how do we deliver that fear message in a business context without it becoming something where people feel like it's a downer at the end. I, I worry a lot about this as we create things that can end in disaster because what we do is we help deal with disaster. We help prevent that or at least bring you back up when disaster happens. But you don't want to end on the feeling of disaster. You want to end on an, on an up note. And I think this encapsulates a lot of that notion of the fear is, is real, right? If you're an IT person, that scenario of the server's down, uh, what the heck am I going to do? And I got to go hit my daughter's recital right now. That's a real palpable fear, and it's a real scenario. Uh, and then the ability to hopefully just recover, as you saw there, is, is key. And that, that's part of this sort of evolution of how do you take these messages and put them into a business context, make them feel real, but also leave people on an up note. I, I want to leave people feeling like, yeah, there's something good that we can bring to it. Even though we sort of traffic in disaster, if you will, there's, there's an opportunity for the ability to end on an up note, and we want to be able to do that. And uh, we use that primarily online, and, uh, and our media agency, several of which are here, uh, have done a great job finding places to put the various, various forms of it. And it's actually done fairly well for us to sort of get that response. But it's also an emotional thing. And uh, it gets back to this notion of when you're building marketing, particularly around the types of things that relate to disasters happening, data intrusions, loss of data, privacy. Having an emotional component is just a given. It's how you choose to use that emotional component that's an important thing for a marketer to think about as we go forward. So uh, I have a few lessons learned of which I've tried to cover off on a lot of them. And I actually have a slide with words on it for this next one here. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of slides in general. Uh, I think that they distract from the ability to sort of talk with people. Uh, however, a long, long, long time ago, uh, in, uh, I was offered a job uh, at Microsoft in the PowerPoint team. And I decided at that point, a very long time ago, uh, to turn them down to go work for a startup. Uh, that was before Microsoft stock went up for the first time. And I would have gotten very, very rich off of that. And I never would have been here as a result. So, uh, However, I, I've long been a fan of using PowerPoint appropriately and not abusing it. So I try to continue to believe that uh, you can get through long presentations with only a handful of slides and just a few bullet points. Let me tell you about some of the things that we've learned as we've gone through this, and some of which I haven't even had a chance to really get in detail on, but I'm happy to talk more after. Flexible and fast execution. <sighs> Five acquisitions in three plus years, integrate those acquisitions, do all of that, 
you have to be able to respond and you have to be able to figure out what are you going to do next. So I built a team that I'm super proud of and, and impresses me every day and I learn from them every day with their ability to be fast and to be flexible. I have them focus on outcomes, not processes. All that matters ultimately in marketing are the outcomes. I don't really care how you get there to a certain extent. Can you get the right outcomes? And then can you do it in a ethical, moral, fun fashion? That's all good. But focus on the outcomes. However, don't ignore the processes. Focus on simplifying them. Because if you simplify the processes, you drive better outcomes. One of the things I did when I got to Carbonite three years ago was begin the process of eliminating a bunch of stuff from my MarTech stack stopping us using a bunch of social channels just because they were cool social channels that had no payback for us. So simplify, simplify, simplify us. A good brand is sticky, for better or worse. I talked about this notion of we're forever going to carry that legacy of being a consumer brand with us. The job on us is, the burden on us rather, is to figure out how to leverage that legacy whenever we can, not to ignore it. And, and we've been as guilty as anyone else of sometimes ignoring our own lesson. But being able to be able to take the value of your brand if you've done a good job with it and pull it forward into whatever new world you're going to visit. And then uh, this last one is sort of the work is greater than the vision. Everybody has a vision. <laughs> My boss has a vision. Our board has a vision. I have a vision. You have a vision. We all have visions. Visions are awesome. We have a vision statement. It's very broad and fabulous, as a matter of fact. But what matters at the end of the day, particularly for marketers, I think, but for any of us, is the work. Do the right work. Let it go out into the market. If it doesn't have the impact you want, redo it. I, I sometimes say to the disenchantment of some of my fellow marketers or certainly some of the people on my team, marketing, for the most part, is ephemeral. Right? We create stuff that we push out into the world, and for the most part, it disappears. It has its impact or it doesn't. But if you, most of you cannot remember the campaign you did a year ago, right? because you did one campaign after another campaign after another campaign. Most marketing is fairly ephemeral. That doesn't lessen its importance, but it gives you context of thinking about the work and moving forward endlessly driving on those outcomes and being able to let go of treating the work as precious and focus on what are the outcomes that the work drives. And in fact, if you do that, the work ends up kind of being better if you don't treat it as precious all the time. So it's a set of lessons. We've been through a lot. I know we have some time for questions. Uh, and on that note, I will turn it over to questions. And thank you for your attention while I was speaking. Hi, so that was terrific. Thank you very much. And um, I'm curious, um, how would you, so you said you have a vision statement, of course, and a mission statement. Every company course. does, vision, mission, yeah, yeah we all have those. Right. <laughs> what is your brand statement? Uh, we don't have a brand statement per se. We or focus on the vision, mission. We have a set of brand attributes. Our vision statement really is to basically protect all the data in the world. We just tweaked it a little bit against any threat possible. I'm, I'm ad-libbing on that. Uh, the brand stands for the same thing as the vision. The brand stands for protection. The brand is supposed to create a sense of comfort, trust, reliability, simplicity, all of the things that you want from a business that you can trust to, in fact, protect your data. And, and there's a second order point to that. If you're in the business of protecting people's data, you darn well better be trustworthy and you better exemplify that trust wherever you can and you better think about it as you go through and exemplify it. If you're not in the business of protecting people's data, guess what? You actually are. <laughs> you all have data. You all should be protecting it. I don't care what business you're in. So you better figure out how to embody trust as a core component of what you bring to market because sooner or later you're going to get confronted with your data being breached in some form, and then you're going to have to step up, and you better hope that they trust you, because if they don't, it's going to tumble down really quickly. Other questions? Um, so in the ad that you showed, I noticed that the 
um, really the payoff at the end is really about the personal value to the individual. That's really the culmination of it. Was that just coincidence, or is that part of your B2C, B2B transition? Fabulous question, insightful observation about the ad. Uh, <laughs> In technology, and if, if, I don't know if you work in tech or not, but uh, IT pros and developers are people, and they want to be seen as the hero, and they want to get that sense of personal satisfaction of doing the right thing. If you make ads for IT pros or developers and you focus too much on the outcome to the business, in fact, it doesn't land very well. And we, you see this, and when I was, years ago when I was at Microsoft and I, I did a ton of audience marketing to the developer audience and evangelism to the developer audience, we learned through a lot of effort time and time again, what matters is them. They are uniquely human and, and want payoff the same way any of us do. So that shows this transition, but you can imagine that individual, David, the dad, right? He darn well probably has Carbonite, hopefully, on his personal computer, as well as having it in his entire IT infrastructure, and he's going to get as much satisfaction from that as anything else. Like I get the greatest satisfaction, even though I'm a marketer, I'm pretty technical. Uh, just recently, as I was telling how recently, I think that uh, my daughter sent me a phishing email she'd gotten, and she said, this looks funny, what should I do? And I was super proud of the fact that I've like inculcated in my daughter, you know, who's 15, don't click on links because they're phishing emails. And in fact, was a great phishing email. So the, the personal is actually key there. And, and, and understanding the mind of those types of audiences is critical. IT pros have a very uh, real attachment to being able to save things, right? being able to be the hero. Developers, we, we learned this long ago at, at Microsoft, Developers want lots of information. We, we did this whole thing when I was working on Visual Studio, which is the development environment, and we ran digital ads, right? The more words we put in the CTA button, the more likely they were to click because they wanted detailed explanations of what was going to happen when they clicked the button because that's how developers think. So things that sometimes seem inherently like don't make sense actually work really well if you know the audience. There, Making them the hero is everything. Uh, Andrew Willis with Insider Inc. Um, when you talk about the transition from B2C to B2B and the full funnel approach, how do you weigh brand awareness versus lead gen, and how do you try and make those efforts complement each other? As we've made that transition, we've, we've spent a lot of time sort of focusing on brand awareness and measuring it. Uh, and, and brand perception, how people see the brand, and then the lead gen. And what we found is we can do a lot of lead gen. We get a certain amount just from brand awareness, but we can do a lot of lead gen that, that's really focused on people searching for very specific types of solution, whether it be for server backup or things of that nature. And it's only that the brand part comes in later. But we also know that if we, as we did when we drop brand spend, all of our demand efficiency goes down. So having a certain degree of brand spend brings up the efficiency of demand spend. And I, I like to think of it always as you know, brand and demand are two sides of the same coin. If you think of them as living in completely separate universes, you're going to miss the point, right? They, they're tightly intertwined with each other. And I have this discussion more often than not once a month with a, every executive recruiter that calls me and says, hey, this company's looking for a new CMO and they want somebody who specializes in brand or they want somebody who specializes in demand. And I have the same discussion with every one of them. Well, how do you know? And don't you know the two things are related? And what turns out is companies identify, typically not the marketer, somebody inside the company, the CEO or whomever decides, oh, we have a brand problem go hire a brand marketer, or oh, we have a demand problem, go hire a demand marketer. And it turns out that if you ignore that the fact that the two things are so tightly interrelated, you end up coming up with the wrong solution. And that means that you have to think holistically about brand and demand. What's, gonna, what's brand going to do to efficiency of your demand spend? What's a large amount of demand spend going to do to brand perception? Those are things that are tightly intertwined.
We have a second question. That's good. <laughs> Um, so this isn't specific to Carbonite, but in your presentation talking about sort of the role of marketing as it relates to data protection and privacy in, in their company, there's a certain irony, I think, in that marketing, you know, data-driven marketing is all about, or made possible in many ways by, by getting people's data. Yep that they may not want you to have necessarily. How do you sort of reconcile that and where do you see that going forward as people become more aware of privacy and the importance of protecting their data? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a problem that we all deal with uh, a lot. And I, I don't have a good answer uh, and I have my answer. And my answer is that ultimately there has to be a, a line and you have to figure out where that line's gonna be. And because you can go all the way over here or you can sort of stay over here, but you're gonna have to collect data. You will have to use that data. You have to think about how you use that data and what are you doing to the audiences that you're going after? And where is that line? I, I recommend, by the way, if you're interested in, in the topic overall, there's a, there's a new book that came out just recently, The, uh, the Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, by uh, Shoshana Zuboff, who actually teaches at Harvard. Uh, it's a big, thick book, like 700 pages, but I highly recommend it. Uh, and she wrote uh, one of the seminal texts many years ago the, in the age of the smart machine that sort of laid the foundation. But when she talks about surveillance capitalism, it addresses some of these very issues on how to rethink the problem of how data by, used by companies like Google and everyone else uh, is transforming us as individuals and as consumers and, and what our place in the ecosystem is. And as marketers, I think we have to be very aware and sensitive of, is there a line? Do we have a personal sense of that line? Does the company have a sense of that line? And how do you know when you've crossed it? How do you know when you've gone too far in taking that data and becoming intrusive upon an individual's right to privacy, an individual's right to not have everything known. It's, it's a problem I think about all the time. I know everyone you know, here probably does in one form or another. Uh, I think it's necessary, however, for marketers to not only think about the problem because we use the data, but also be able to better articulate the problem because we're really good at articulating problems typically and helping people see that there might be something there for us to sort of chew on and come up with a better approach overall because that, uh, I think the role of marketing ultimately is not just to do, but to also to cast a light upon and to help others see and make their own decisions around it. Um, oh, sorry, I was just wondering, you had the problem of convincing people that you were no longer a business to consumer company and now a business to business company. What media did you use to get that message out there and why? Yeah, uh, we, we spent a lot of money on uh, digital. We have, uh, we've continued to invest in search and display ads, but we also have invested uh, in out of home and print. Uh, am I missing anything, Bob? Uh, it's, uh, we, we've done, we've, we've been doing radio in various forms for a long time. So we think about it from the, the executive audience that we're trying to get to from the broad set of potential buyers or channel partners uh, and then the sort of mass set of users and so we sort of stratify that. Most of our spend is digital, however we actually have found things like out of home print and other uh, things that we've done have had really interesting impact in very specific ways. We, we ran a program with uh, Bloomberg Business Week where we did wraps on the magazine and sent it to uh, like a couple of thousand subscribers with a sort of free trial subscription. Uh, not super measurable, but interesting to hear lots of anecdotal feedback uh, that comes in on how that affects people's perception of the brand. Uh, we have a billboard. How many people have seen our billboard? Great. Uh, most people who talk, I, by the way, it's the number one thing that people say, hey, I saw your billboard. Um, mm -hmm. Lots and lots of people think we have lots and lots of billboards because it sticks in your mind, and like, oh, I saw your billboard when I was on 93 or, or whatever. Uh, we have exactly one billboard. <laughs> we, we rotate the picture that's on that billboard uh, on a regular basis, but we have exactly one, but it has really interesting impact here just in Boston on people saying, oh, I saw your billboard. When I was on some highway, oh, did, where'd you see it? And I, I know that I can bait people and say, oh, did you see the one on 128? And they would probably say yes. 
Right. So it's, it's an interesting impact of something like out of home. This next question is going to be the last one. All right. Who has a last question? Okay. Um, I know you said you're still on the journey, but roughly how long has it taken to make the transition? Uh, forever. <laughs> you know, I think that we were on that. I think we've made a lot of progress in the past two years. I would say that year one for me was a lot of sort of figuring out everything that we had to do and making a bunch of changes and sort of getting the infrastructure in place. Years two and three, we've done a lot. Now we're actually shifting focus again and making some additional changes as we continue to grow through acquisition, as we make some changes on our go-to-market strategy. So I think we are, we're more than halfway. I just don't know how far past halfway we are because it could change tomorrow or as it did last Thursday when I had SA, I'm buying uh, you know, a big company and, oh, by the way, it has this consumer business, but please just ignore the consumer part and talk about this other thing. So we're more than halfway, I hope. And I think that was the last question. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.